you got your Bibles, turn me to the book of Matthew, chapter 25. Now, I was, boy, the Lord had been messing me up all day. I, today. I, uh, what I was going to preach in the first service, uh, I was going to preach tonight. And, uh, and what I preached, uh, what I was going to preach in the first, I was going to preach tonight, and the Lord changed that. And maybe uh, Lisa was uh, saying something about what well, she was receiving the tithe and offering for the church. And God began to quicken me. And Sister Doty got up and spoke a few things and used that same word, and it hit me again. And the Lord said, are you going to listen to me? I said, look like I am. <laughs> so I just preached out of my spirit in the first service. And then this sermon that I was going to minister, the Lord gave me this yes, uh, day before yesterday. I just wrote it down. And uh, I was going to do that in, the, uh, in, uh, in another service. And the Lord said, go back there and get this. I said, why did I even study? <laughs> he said, because you needed everything you studied. <laughs> so Matthew chapter 25 Excuse me, Matthew, yeah, chapter 25. I want to start reading with verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened to ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. Now, why were they foolish and why were they wise? It'll tell us in just a minute. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. In other words, they took a little extra. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered. So all of them fell asleep. And at midnight, there was a cry made. Behold, look, the bridegroom cometh to go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. So now you got to understand, they come out of a slumber. They've been sleeping. They hear this cry. Now watch this. Now, what they failed to realize, their lamps are still burning when they fell asleep. Verse 8, and the foolish said unto the wise, give us your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go you rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterwards came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. Ladies and gentlemen, people write my office and call our offices all the time, and uh, I do have access to God. I serve the Most High God, and I'm part of the Most High family. And I want you to understand this, and so are you if you're born again. That when God looks at man, he is amazed at the creation of man. Because he says it in Psalms 8, What is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visiteth him. So notice that man and the son of man are in the same verse. Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. Now the translators translated that word angels because they didn't want, to get, they didn't want people to kill him. Because in the original text it says, Thou hast made him a little lower than God. That doesn't mean you are the son of God. None of us are, uh, uh, we'll never be the son of God, but we are a sons of God. And the difference between me and you, and I had to correct a man the other day. He said, Jesse Duplantis, he introduced me, one of the greatest servants of God. I got up and said, excuse me, I'm not a servant of God. Don't you lower my status. <laughs> Angels are servants of God. Now, I'm shocking some of you right now. Some of you are telling me, I'm ready to cut the television off. Get your hand off the remote control. <laughs> I ain't finished yet. Before you just judge me, hang on, let me finish. <laughs> Who do you think you are? I'm trying to tell you. You got to notice something about angels. Gabriel, Michael, the archangel have to stand at attention in the presence of God. No one sits down in God's presence except you. Because he made us sit in heavenly places with him. Do you understand? Angels are servants of God. Me and you are sons of God that serve. We're in the family. We are family. Uh, you understand? Family. Get that little move. Come on. You see what I'm saying? That means the only people that can sit in the presence of God is you. That we're the family of God. We are family. We are sons and daughters that serve. Angels are serving. Our ministering spirits sent forth to minister. To who? Us. I want to establish that right away. You got to understand something. When you got, if you don't know who you are, then, then when, you, when you meet yourself, you won't know who you're talking to. 
You see, the devil's always tried to take our position and put it lower. And he don't like it because he, he was an angel that fell. So he, he's the most low. And we serve the most high. Do you get that? I, I'm just preparing you here. So notice this. No one can sit in the presence of a king unless they're another king. Notice when kings sit down, buddy, ain't nobody sitting with them unless there are other kings sitting. And the Bible has made us kings and priests. So when you get to heaven, you're going to see God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, and then man. Because the only people sitting at the very throne of God are men, or the 24 elders, as God, they sit when God sits. Every angel standing at attention. Do you understand that? So angels are more interested in you than you are in them. A lot of people don't think that, but that is simply true. They are amazed at how God has created such a wonderful person in his image. Now, these 10 girls came down there to go to a wedding. But they, and it's at night. A lot, of, a lot of people get married at night for some reason, you know. And they had to have some lamps. They didn't have electricity. Some brought a lamp and some brought a vessel with a lamp. And then naturally they got tired because weddings are always late. And, and women are not on time. And that's not a shot, that's just the truth. I have to wait on Kathy all the time. Isn't that, didn't John Osteen used to say that? Like, I'm trying to be, no, I better not be John, praise God. <laughs> no, my point simply is this. Weddings usually never start on time. You know, and that's okay, I guess. But this was the bridegroom. So now, ladies, before you go, oh, the bridegroom was late. <laughs> See, the girls were already there. It was the bridegroom. So why aren't we walking down the aisle? How come the woman always got to walk down the aisle? How come the man can't just walk down the aisle? <laughs> I thought it was normal. Now watch this. When you see this, naturally they hear a cry and they come out of a sleep. Because sometimes weddings are noisy. You know, people cry at weddings. Some people laugh at weddings. You know, I'll never forget when I got married, we had 22 people standing on the altar. You should have seen this wedding. Oh, I mean, it was something, man. I mean, we had 22. There were uh, 18 bridegroom, uh, what do they call them? The, you know, the people that walk down there and all that stuff. <laughs> and then the ring bearers. And by the time I got down there, I almost changed my mind. I mean, it just took forever. I thought, my God, man, when am I going to get down there? And of course, my mother-in-law was going <laughs> like that. <laughs> I said, God, if you feel like killing anybody, you can kill her. <laughs> I didn't like her. She didn't like me. Boy, I mean, it, it, we knew. We, we, and y'all heard me say that last time I was here. But now she loved me. And I love her. Because we're both saved. <laughs> well, that's true. We didn't love each other when we weren't saved. But notice they begin to ask for other oil so they wouldn't run out. The title of this message today is, God doesn't give big oil to foolish people. Notice this, foolish people. God doesn't give big oil. You have to have more than just what's in your depository. You have to have more because you, see, because you never know when the Lord will come. Now, a lot of people ask me, do you think Jesus is coming in your lifetime? That's what I'm believing for. But if he don't come get me, I go get him. Either way, we're going. <laughs> I mean, the end result's the same. I'm going to the same place. People worry about all this terrorist thing. I, don't, I mean, I don't let no terrorists just dis disrupt my life. By no means, never will I ever. I would never do anything of that. No, not me. Uh-uh. I had a guy say, suppose you got on a plane and they hijack and kill you. I said, I go to heaven. Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> See, well, either way, whether I go by the rapture, and some people don't believe in the rapture, so stay here. <laughs> you do whatever you want. Or whether I go in another way, I'm still going. You see, people ask me about my mother all the time. Did your mother pass away in 1982? I said, no, my mama's not in my past. My mama's in my future. Can I give you an understanding? Do you know your husband is not in your past? He is in your future. If you know somebody that went home to be with the Lord, ladies and gentlemen, if you're born again, you're going to see them because they're not in your past. They are in your future. That's why you don't grieve. 
You don't grieve because they're not in your past. They are in your future. And when you understand that, it comforts you. See, I'm going to see my mama like my daddy saw mama. I ain't never seen my mama like my daddy saw. He saw when she was 15 years old. I saw when she was fat and had big arms, you know, and all kinds of stuff like that. Now, I can only say that because she's dead, because she'd kill me if she was here. <laughs> see, I never seen it like I had my dad tell me, I was like, you should have seen your mama. <laughs> Woo, your mama, Lord, Lord. But see, when I remember mama, she kind of had them little hog jowls, gray hair, big fat arms, you know, mama. But that's true. But daddy saw her when she was 15. He saw the way she really looked. One day I'm, I'm going to heaven and I'm going to see mama like daddy saw her. I'm going to say, whoo, get down with your bad self, mama. Hey, Lord, look at mama. Isn't that wonderful? My daughter never seen me like Kathy saw me. My daughter made 30 years old not long ago. She hadn't seen me like Kathy. Kathy saw me. I was so good looking. You should have seen me. <laughs> Kathy says I'm a legend in my own mind. Somebody got to believe in me. <laughs> I was good looking. You got to see it by faith, but it's the truth. <laughs> We'd go to a beach and Kathy would tell me to put a shirt on. Because I had muscles. <laughs> Now, when we go to the beach, she says, don't take that shirt off, Jesse. I said, okay. <laughs> so Jody, my daughter, going to see me like Kathy saw me when I was 18 years old. When you're 18, you got to get that little walk, you know. <laughs> and, and them girls go, As you get older, now you walk. Okay, come on. <laughs> you have to buy things to fix yourself up. Like, you know, control top panty holes, just stuff it in there. And, you know, make things tight. <laughs> and big control tops are powerful. They'll pull a car, boy. I ain't kidding. <laughs> I know exactly what a lot of you ladies are going to do after this service. I know you got them. I can tell you got them control tops on. You're like, yes. I know what's going to happen when you get home. You're going to get home go, oh, oh. Now look at these young people. Now, nah, oh no, your day is coming. It's going to happen, buddy. One day. Now, let me go on before somebody kill me here. Five, ten virgins, five foolish five wise. What makes people foolish? You are today, write this down, you are today what yesterday's choices have made you. Write that down. You are today what yesterday's choices have made you. See, if you don't create a future, you'll never have a present. Let me say that again. You are today, I am today what I decided yesterday. Did you get that? Now, see, this is the problem with these girls. They all were destined to go into that marriage. They all were virgins. They all fell asleep. So the ones sleeping, I mean, the ones that had more oil than the other, they wasn't that they were better. They just made a choice the day before to carry some extra. You are today what yesterday's choices have made you. You see, I never tell you what I, I never tell you what I, what I, ha I don't show you what I have. You already see that. I tell you what I want. I, I don't tell you where I am. You already know that. I tell you where I'm going. You say, I'm always ahead. I'm never behind. He made me the what? The head and not the tail. <clears throat> so listen to it. You are today what yesterday's choices have made you. Faith will be given, will be given great moments to show itself. Faith is patience with the lamp lit. You see, these girls didn't have enough patience to go get some extra oil in their vessels. So that if the lamp would run out, they would have enough. It don't make no difference. The Lord don't mind you falling asleep. As long as you have what you're supposed to have when you wake up. You understand? <clears throat> now I want you to see this. So 
Yeah, let me say this point again. You are today what yesterday's choices have made you. Faith will give you moments to show, to show itself. God will give you an opportunity today through faith for faith to show itself. It's all up to you to receive that. You see, every day I look for a, a way to enhance and to make my faith grow. I do it spiritually. I do it physically. I do it financially. I will not give to God what I gave him last year. Why? Already done that. Not going to do that no more. Did that. Been there. Done that. I am going to do better than that. Well, what about recessions? Uh, we don't participate. <laughs> now, why? Because we're rich? No. It's because we don't live by the economy of the United States or the state or the county. We live by our giving. See, I quit making a living long time ago. Because making a living is tough. That's called making ends meet. And you know, you just can't seem to do it. That's why you're looking for a job for your wife. You're trying to find a job for your dog. <laughs> and Taco Bell's hiring chihuahuas. You might want to go down there. Anything to try to make some money. That's a tough way to live. That's making a living. God never told you to make a living. You said that. The world said, God told you to make a given and live off the seed you sow by the harvest that grows from it. So you are today what yesterday's choices have made you. Faith will be given great moments to show itself. So what is faith? Faith is patience with that lamp lit. I made up my mind. That doesn't mean the devil don't attack me. I've had the devil attack me financially. And what I immediately do is confuse him. And he's very easily confused because he's the author of confusion. You can confuse the devil real quick. He's an idiot. I mean, why would you cause a revolution in, in heaven? Are you crazy? And no angel can whip God? Why? Because God made the angel. So notice this. I have an opportunity for faith to show itself. These girls had an opportunity by the decision they made yesterday to be what they should have been today. So you see, a habit of faith always produces a habit of action. Write that down. If you're understanding something about faith, God doesn't give big all to foolish people. A habit of faith always produces a habit of action. Faith without works is dead. You can talk this stuff all day long, but if you don't do nothing about it, it won't work. See, the reason why I tell people to give and expect a harvest, because I did it when I had money, and I did it when I didn't have money. It didn't have anything to do with my possession. It had to do with my action. You know, because God will honor anything I give him. Because on your best day, you're not, you, you cannot impress God with your wealth. This is El Shaddai. This ain't El Chipo. You understand? This is God. You understand? He owns the universe. And do you think he needs what you have? No. But you need everything he has. Now, how do we get his stuff? How do we get what he has? By sowing seed. Seed is the principle that God used to create the earth. He's the principle God used to create you. Think about that. That's exactly how that works. So <clears throat> a habit of faith always produces a habit of action. So see, these girls had faith, but they didn't have enough action to go get enough oil to complete what their destiny so they could reach their destination, which made them foolish. Now, God doesn't give big oil to foolish people. I've had people say, why does God bless you? You don't seem to struggle. And, I, and I, can I be honest? I don't mean this. Arrogantly. I do not struggle. Do I look like I struggle? I don't struggle at all. I'm not broke. I tried broke. I, I didn't like it. <laughs> I find broke don't help nobody. Broke is broke. <laughs> you ever seen two poor people talk to each other? <laughs> Have you ever seen that? Ain't much said. <laughs> well, how you doing? Without. <laughs> now, it's not a shame. You shouldn't be ashamed to be poor. Don't misunderstand me. What I'm saying is, but God gives you the ability to get out of poverty, whether that's spiritual physical or financial. See, poverty is not just money. I see poverty of spirit a lot. I see poverty of mind quite often. See, I, I see a lack. Poverty simply means one word, and it's a four-letter word, lack. See, Christians use too many four-letter words. Poor, sick, lack. Think about that. You understand what I'm saying? When you ought to be using what the Word of God has for you today. So when you see, never first thing first, you never trust another oil supply to keep you burning. Write that down. 
never trust another's oil supply to keep you burning. Let me just say this. Whether Brother Hagin would have ever been born or Brother Copeland or anybody you deem it. I mean, I love those men. I love those women. Bless God. But I tell you what, I don't trust their supply of oil to keep me burning. Do you understand what I'm saying? I don't go to a, 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 a someone's ministry to stir me up. I stir myself up. In fact, I keep stirring. I'm a Cajun. If you want a good gumbo, it's the secrets in the root. Now, what's the root? Well, it can be a lot of different things. But you've got to get that thing just right. And you've got to keep stirring. And you better, and if, and if it just, if it's two seconds too long, it don't taste no good. It's burnt. See, I just stir myself up. I do. God is my witness. I look at myself in the mirror. You've heard me say it at many times. And I just preach to myself. Yeah, yeah, God, God. I mean, I speak in tongues. Blah, 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 blah. Then, I, then, I, then I prophesy. And then I interpret. And I give an offering. And I receive an offering. I, don't I mean, I do it all for myself. Now, that may sound nuts to you, but that's not nuts to me. Because you see, I do not rely on other people's oil supply to keep me burning. And that's the problem with a lot of Christians. Bless God. The only thing they understand about faith is a Brother Hagin book. Great book. Let me just say something about my books. Dodie's books. Whatever. We write great books. Well, why it, what's the difference between my book and this book? Man's books are fossilized human thoughts frozen on a page. They're good. They're fossilized. But this book is living, breathing, decreeing, declaring the oracle of God. Now, my books are good. Dodies are good. You ought to get them. But they, see, man, when we write, they fossilized human thoughts put up on a page. But this book is alive because in the beginning was the word. In the beginning is the word. This is Jesus in written form, breathing, beating. So I love what they asked President Reagan in his 10 years as president. He says, they said, if you were stranded upon an island and you had all the libraries of the world to go to, what book, and you only could take one book, what would you take? And President Reagan said this, oh, without a shadow, without take the Bible. They said, well, why? He said, because you can read it over and over and always get something new out of it. <clears throat> are you understanding? So what I'm saying is, is that my books are good. So is Brother Hagin. You ought to get them. Don't misunderstand me. But we fossilized human thoughts. But this book. How many times have you read a verse in the beginning God created heaven and earth? You might have read it a thousand times. All of a sudden you go, oh, it explodes. Revelation. Oh, man. Why? Because it's breathing and living. Well, you see, in that oil, I don't rely on someone else's oil supply to keep me burning. That's the problem with the foolish people. God doesn't give big oil to foolish people because most of the time they're going to rely on something else. See, I tell my daughter this. I have taken care of you, but you're not going to get it till I'm finished with me. And I'm finished with your mama. I have made an inheritance for my children. I only have one daughter, Judy. Now, <clears throat> anybody got a little water or something? I'm getting a little dry here. What is that? I mean, well, this is a cup. Oh, that is a classic. Any Jack got a cup here? <laughs> My Lord, he already oh, got it on this side too, Lord Jesus. Oh, excuse me, I got to put that little finger out. <laughs> That's nice. Ah, now, I made an inheritance for her, and I thought, well, that's good. And the Lord said, you ain't finished. I said, well, I thought I was. He said, you make an inheritance for your children's children. I said, we don't have no kids. I'm not a grand. I look like a grandpa, but I'm not one. He said, that doesn't make any difference. You leave an inheritance for your children's children. So I told Jody, my daughter, I said, Jody, she has a cat. She loves this cat. I'm waiting for this cat to die. <laughs> it's a beautiful cat, but it don't look like we ever gonna get any babies if we don't get the cat out. They love that cat. The cat's named Mia. Mia just walk up to you, you know. If she don't like, she'll go, just snap you, like, move over. You know? So I told Jody the other day, I said, Jody, if you do not give me an heir, 
That's going to be the richest cat in the city of New Orleans. <laughs> we don't want to leave it to the cat. And I have to make an inheritance for my children's children. Now, I've already done that. I have completed that. I have done that. Now, it's up to Jody to give me a little Jesse. <laughs> or a little Kathy. Or both. No pressure. Just worldwide television. <laughs> because I'm not a foolish man. I have watched my life not to be foolish. I don't get angry at anybody because it clouds your reasoning. You start making emotional decisions instead of what I call established or thought out decisions. So when somebody's mad at me, I keep my enemies close to me. Oh, I got some people don't like me and I get right in their face. <laughs> Why? Because they're going to tell me what they're going to do. You see, because when you begin to get angry, then you cloud your reasoning and you can't think properly. See, God made a rational decision when he put Jesus on the cross, the Father. If he'd have made an emotional decision, when Jesus said, why hast thou forsaken me? He'd have pulled that man off that cross and kill everybody there. But he knew the only way he could get to me was for Jesus to stay on that cross. See, so, you know, most people go to the bottom of the cross, the foot of the cross. It's a great place. But what you need to do is climb the cross. Get up where Jesus is so you see what he sees. Then you'll understand the vision and the dream that God had for mankind. And that's why Jesus was put upon the cross. Do you see what I'm saying? That was a yesterday decision that made Jesus today be our Lord and Savior. So let me say it again. You are today what yesterday's choices have made you. Faith will be given great moments to show itself. So what is faith? Faith is patience with that lamp lit. A habit of faith always produces a habit of action. See, the light does not burn without the oil. But never trust another person's oil supply to meet your need. Or never trust another oil supply to keep you burning, to keep you going. So I love revival. Oh my God. But I'm not going there to get revived. I'm going there to be a part of revival. You see, not, I'm not, I, have you ever seen me discouraged? Have you ever seen me depressed? Many of you people know me for a long time. You know, I've had many opportunities. I just don't take any. Many opportunities to get down, get discouraged. I said, no. See, my own family doesn't understand me. That's okay. Because they, they say, I don't grieve enough. Somebody passed away in my family. I go, well, praise God in heaven. Woo! And they go. <laughs> well, see, the difference between me and them, they've lost somebody. I haven't lost anyone. Why? Because they're not in my past. They're in my future. I'm going to see them again. That doesn't mean I don't miss people. I think sometimes I think they misunderstand that. But they don't understand. I have a responsibility to have a merry heart. It's been given to me. I mean, do you know any other preacher with as much joy as me? I have that responsibility to keep that smile there. That ain't easy. That's not easy. But I have to because the face is the index of the condition of your heart. The most important part of your body is your face. Because I don't care how good looking the rest of it is. If you ain't got the face, it's a blind date. <laughs> you know it and I know it. You have been on a blind day. Is she pretty? Well, she nice. I don't care if she nice. Is she pretty? Well, she sweet. Sweet. We ain't talking about sweet and nice. Is she pretty? Well, no, she'll gag a maggot, but bless God, she's a nice person. <laughs> and what does a plastic surgeon, what's the first part of anyone's body they ever lifted? It's amazing to me about people who get facelifts. I don't know why they don't want nobody to know. They already know. It looks like you've been in a hurricane. You're like this. 
Can you tell? Ah, uh, yeah. So, I tell everybody, I'm thinking about getting one myself. I got one of these chicken necks. Look at that. His head just kind of sagging. <laughs> so maybe next time y'all see me, I ain't saying I'm going to, I heard it hurts. That's why I haven't done it yet. <laughs> I don't want to put no pain on me, you know. But if you see me next year and I'm like this, don't say nothing. <laughs> but Kathy said, I'm, Kathy says, Jesse ain't embarrassed about nothing. I'm not. I would tell you, man, look at my Virginia. You know, I, I don't have a problem with that. Glory to God. I mean, I thought about getting liposuction. I, I, I want to suck out this part right here. I hate that. Why diet when you could just, just suck it out? Wouldn't that be wonderful? I didn't have that when Kathy met me. I didn't. But his twin brother live over here now. <laughs> Whole family is right here now. <laughs> People say, are you worried about getting old? No! No! I look about 58 because my hair's so white. I'm 52, but I don't care. That don't bother me whatsoever. They're always telling me to exfoliate myself. <laughs> I didn't even know what that word was. <laughs> Expo. I had a woman who said, you need to be exfoliated. Why she say that? You need to be exfoliated? I said, yo, mama. I had no idea what that meant. I didn't know what that was. Most men, most men never understand that word. Kathy wanted to give me lotions on my face. She said, you got to, you skin, skin. You need to put lotions on you. I like leather. <laughs> I don't care about all that kind of stuff. As long as I can breathe and walk. You know, I'm all right. As long as I can keep going, glory to God, you know? You know? But I know, I guess you can look, nothing wrong with looking better. I, I'll say this on television. We'll have to edit it. I told Jan and Paul, I said, if a hurricane ever hit TV and there'd be enough chocolate water and toupees flying by the pound. It's going everywhere. <laughs> Lord, <laughs> Look at <laughs> I was preaching with a guy one time. He had fake fall. He had fake sideburns on. They were sliding down. I went. <laughs> Write this point down. Never miscalculate the strain of the enterprise you have been given. Nothing is easy but it's doable. Never miscalculate the strain of the enterprise you have been given. The secret of Christian wisdom is to keep the oil stores replenished. I stir myself up daily, not just Sunday. But I never miscalculate the strain of the enterprise. People think preaching's easy. Let me tell you the easiest part is this here. But the hard part is getting to this. I don't doubt when Pastor John Osteen said, Joel, why don't you preach? Joel figured, oh, Lord. Now, he ain't told me this, but I don't, no. Let, let me, I'll do the television. Call. Because you got to come up with something every week. You come to receive. Do you know how much study and how much understanding and how much you got to think to get it? Because you're going to remember what we said. I like what one preacher did. He preached the same sermon 21 days in a row. 21 straight nights. Now, I wouldn't mind doing that myself. And finally, they said, are you going to preach something different? He said, well, when you get this one, then we'll go to another one. <laughs> now, that makes a lot of sense. But you have to constantly dig out the word of the Lord God. So it is a strain at times. How many times somebody might say, you might be in a meeting, and maybe they did it to Pastor John it, when you and... and Pastor Osteen would come to me. They'd say, uh, Pastor John, why don't y'all just come, come up and receive the offering for us? Now, John was just coming to sit down and enjoy himself. All of a sudden, you got to get up there and go, oh, Lord, what I'm going to say? What I'm going to do? And there's everybody looking at you. <laughs> that is not an easy thing. Do you understand what I'm saying? See, you have to constantly. So don't miscalculate the strain of the enterprise. 
that's been given to you. Christian ignorance is neglecting personal soul culture. See, life is full of emergencies, but I've prepared for everyone. You see, I do have an emergency room in my spirit. I've prepared myself just in case I didn't suck up on enough faith that day. Let me tell you why you should never miss church. And it's not because I'm saying it because I'm a preacher. Because you're going to need everything you hear. See, people, you may not need it the next day. And you may not need it on Tuesday. But may, you may not need it on Wednesday. But come Friday, you're going to be saying, thank God it's Friday. You see, you need, you need to constantly refill your oil stores or refill your spirit. Because the reason why some people do not get healed, it's not because they have a lack of faith or an abundance of unbelief, and that can happen. Usually you might have used all the faith you had for that last sickness, and you have to restore and replenish yourself. See, I have to constantly do that. I do that in my own spirit. I have to keep my joy level up. How do I do that? By speaking the word of God, by challenging myself so I can grow further. I all, I'm constantly keeping a record on myself. I'm keeping a record on what I give, and I'm always increasing my faith, constantly doing that, because God don't give big oil to foolish people. I have to be ready in the event someone else delays me. A delay is not a denial. See, God is not trying to stop you. Sometimes God is never late, but he ain't never early neither. He's always on time. But there are a lot of people that you be, may be walking with that are dragging their feet. And you better have a little extra just in case something happens. So I keep an emergency room in my spirit. What does that mean? Well, so I, I can give you a prime example. The Lord, usually I go before the Lord and I say, Lord Jesus, I start off today. This is the day the Lord hath made. We're going to rejoice and be glad in it. Today is my receiving day. Everything I touch prospers. I'm blessed in the city, blessed in the field. All the benefits of God belong to me. I quote scripture to myself. My body, if he took my infirmity, I don't want any. If he bore my sickness, I don't need any. I will not bear grief because he bore my grief. I will not carry sorrow because he carried my sorrow. That doesn't mean I don't cry. That doesn't mean I don't laugh. Don't misunderstand me. But I don't carry it. So then I fill myself up with the word of God. And you know what? Every time when I haven't done that, I got in trouble. I'll tell you a story that I'm a little embarrassed about. Don't tell nobody. Keep it to yourself. <laughs> I got up. A pastor wanted to take me around. This was in Dallas, Texas. A pastor wanted to take me around, show me around. This was years ago. Now, when I got up, I normally would go pray, get myself prepared. Says the Lord, you know, pray and ask, thank you, Lord. But I didn't. Man, I, got, I slept a little later than I thought I would. He was going to be there in about 25 minutes. But it made no difference. All I had to do was just pray a little bit. I said, well, let me get dressed. And I could, I could and the Lord don't urge you. He just kind of touch you, you know. I said, oh, don't worry about it. I said, I'll just pray when I get back. God's not a second best God. So sure enough, pastor picked me up. Man, I ran out the room. We went all over Dallas. We enjoyed ourselves. All this kind of stuff. I was supposed to preach that night at 7 o'clock. I got back about 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Actually, I was a little tired from doing I had a wonderful day. It was great. But I put God last. So I come walking. I get my key. It's one of those key, hotel key. It's not a key. It's one of those card things. Stick it in there, and it don't work. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> what is the problem? And then I noticed something hanging on the doorknob. Would you please come to the front desk? So I said, okay. So I go to the front desk. I said, excuse me, I'm in room 216. My card doesn't work. And also there was a note that was put on the doorknob to please come to the front desk. And I watched this. I was feeling good. I was in a good mood. And there was this gentleman. He goes, wow. <laughs> so I'm just looking at him. I said, do I have a message? Yes, I want to let you know that your credit card Yes, it's expired. And we need another method of payment before we can let you back in the room. I said, my credit card expired. I said, I didn't put down my credit card. Well, whoever put this credit card down on this room, it's expired. I said, well, could I look at it? Turn out it was the Church's American Express. And it expired just one day. Just, you know, that happened sometimes. They didn't notice it. I said, now watch. When I ran out, all my money, my wallet, Everything was in the room. Because <laughs> we was going out jogging and being there swimming and all this kind of stuff. I said, so, so I said, young man, I said, I tell you what, if you'll open up the room, I said, I will give you my credit card, I'm, you know, and then you can just put it on, we'll just take care of that. He said, I will not open up that door unless I have another method of payment. <laughs> I said, excuse me. I said, listen, 
if I even have cash, I will just pay it. I said, all you got to do is open up the door and I'll just pay and we'll take care of that. I will not open up that door unless we have another payment. I said, no, I don't think you understand what I'm saying. I'm not trying to, it's just a mistake. Uh, when they put the, you know, they didn't realize, they didn't look at the expiration date. He said, well, I'll just tell you one thing. I will not open up that door unless I have another method of payment. Now, by that time, Tabasco sauce is coming up my leg. My Cajunness is coming out of me. My oil lamp has done went out. All my oil is in the room. I have now become a foolish man. I remember when I walked out, I said, I ought to take that. Nah, it'll be all right. I said, look, 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 young man, listen to me, listen to me. I got a little louder. Listen to me. All you got to do is open up the door. I will give you a credit card or I will give you cash. And he was kind of a sweet boy. And don't write me no ugly letter. He says, I will not open up that door unless I have another method of payment. I said, I'm going to tell you one more time and listen to me. <laughs> Open up the door. <laughs> I will pay you. And we won't have this conversation anymore. You don't need to raise your voice. <laughs> I will not open up that door unless I have another method of payment. <laughs> and I heard this voice. Hit him. was audible. It was a foolish voice. Hit him. And I thought, I got enough money to get out of jail. I'm going to hit this sucker right now. And I reached over the counter and grabbed it. Now, this kind of hotel lobby had those kind of like at a bank where you have teller window, you know. And I pulled him through <laughs> off that his feet are in the window. And he going, oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. I said, I'm going to beat your stinking brain out your head. And I saw this phone. <laughs> I picked it up. I said, you see, it says at and I'm going to print that on your forehead. <laughs> bam, bam, I'm going to bust you. I was mad. I was angry. I lost it. <laughs> my light was out. My oil leaked. I was in trouble. And this man going, oh, please, oh, no. Oh, no. I am not exaggerating. I said, I'm going to break your stinking door down, too. You understand? But I'm going to put you in the hospital. Because, see, the old Jessica, I'm going to make you an offer. You know <laughs> True story. Here come the manager of the hotel. Oh, no, sir, don't hit him. I am ran back to Buster. I said, this stupid wimp, fool. I got money in this room. And he won't open up the door. He said, I'm, whoa, just control yourself, sir. I, I said, I'm going to bust these. Uh -uh. He said, I'll help you. I'm the manager. What's the problem? I said, the credit card's expired. I got money in the room. I got another card in the room. And the fool won't open it up. And what are you hiring? He, he's whipping. He's, you know how he is. <laughs> He said, I am so sorry, sir. What's your room? I said, 268. He said, I'll get the key. We'll go open it up right now. I said, I'll pay you. So I'm walking by him. I'm hot. Mad. Walk with the manager. God is my witness. He says, what do you do for a living? I wanted to tell him I, I work for Amway. <laughs> I'm a motivational speaker. I'm thinking, God, I want to kill a man in the lobby. I lost it. He said, you didn't pray.
You didn't put me first. You would have needed me. You needed me today. But your lamp's out. You're foolish. What do you do for a living? I said, um, I said, listen. <laughs> I said, I'm a preacher. He said, I can tell. That's exactly what he said. He said, I thought so. I said, sir. He said, you're the fourth preacher that this front desk gentleman has done this to. He hates preachers. He said, I'm going to have to fire him. I told him if he'd do it again, I'm going to fire him. But he saw the the credit card and it was from a church. Figured you was a preacher. He just is going to harass you. He said, but I thought for a minute I wouldn't have to fire him. I thought we'd, we would bury him instead. <laughs> I said, sir, I'm sorry. I did wrong. God, forgive me. And I ask you to forgive me. He said, oh, that's all right. I never did like the guy. He started, I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I said, no. I'm a minister of the gospel. I, now, this was years ago. I've grown a little bit. <laughs> I said, I apologize. I said, I'm sorry. He said, oh, he said, he, he, he doesn't, he just doesn't like it. So when I, I said, I got to apologize to him. So I come back in it. I said, young man, oh, don't hit me. <laughs> I said, listen, I apologize. I should not have done that. I'm a man of God. Yes. I said, I apologize. I should not. What you did was wrong. But I apologize for acting the way I acted. I asked you to forgive me. I will not forgive you. Now, my, I heard the other voice. Okay, since he won't, kill him. <laughs> I first told you to hit him. Now, kill him. I said, shut up devil, I bind you in Jesus' name. Now, I was wrong to do that. But let me tell you why I couldn't control that. Because I didn't have my daily breakfast of faith with God. I missed my opportunity for faith to work greatly in my life that day. And my lamp went out. I had no one to draw oil from. But even I couldn't even rely on them, even if someone would have been there. And I'll prove this. So I called the pastor. And the pastor said, he said, Jesse, I'm going to come pick you up a little bit earlier. I thought, oh, Lord, I just got in the room. So I told him what happened. He said, what? You mean, that, what? What? You mean they wouldn't let you in the room? I said, no, listen, listen. You know, I can't believe, bam, he's hanging the phone on. I'm coming down there, bam. Hang I said, oh, Lord, here come the pastor. Well, I want to tell y'all something. I put all my guest speakers in this room and you don't let my guest speaker in this embarrassment to me and my church and I'll not use any of you people. I said, control you. You need to learn to control that temper. <laughs> I told him that. He went, oh, I'm sorry. I said, man, what's the matter with you? I said, man, don't you know how to control yourself? I know, no, no. Let me pray for you. That's a true story. Then I told him, I said, man, I wanted to hit the guy over the telephone. <laughs> but you see what he said? You know what, Jesse? I had the same thing. I wanted to make sure you'd have a great day, but I ran out. I didn't do what I normally do with the Lord. Yeah. God don't get big all the foolish people. See, Christian ignorance is neglecting personal soul culture. Now, let me say this. It is wrong to worry over tomorrow. It's wrong. But it is right to anticipate and to prepare for it. You should never worry over tomorrow, but you should prepare for tomorrow. See, the virgin girls did not prepare for tomorrow, just in case somebody may be late. But now it's wrong to worry about tomorrow, because the Bible said, take no thought for your life. But it's nothing wrong with anticipating and preparing for tomorrow. See, we cannot transfer grace. Time will always reveal shallowness. See, when you miss your opportunity... That time will reveal the shallowness that's in your life, whether it's for just one time or whether it's for a year that you haven't been operating and functioning in the Word of God. If there's no grace on earth, there can be no grace in heaven. 
One thing that's good about Oasis of Love here, this great church, they give you grace. Why? Because they plant grace, grace will be harvested greatly, not only here, but also in heaven. Because if, if there is no grace on earth, there is no grace in heaven. You see, let me say it again. If you don't create a future, you will never have a present. Or in other words, you are today what yesterday's choices have made you. You see, now all of them are virgins. All of them fell asleep. But the difference one, one prepared for a delay. One, they weren't believing for it. They just carried an extra vessel of oil. Now, if I would have done what I normally do, I would not have lost my temper at that gentleman in that hotel. If the pastor would have done what he normally does, he would not have done it. We're all human beings. We do make mistakes. You see what I'm saying? But there are a lot of mistakes can be avoided if we prepare ourselves. That when the bridegroom comes, we're ready. Give the Lord a hand clap. <clears throat> oh, you understand? There are going to be a lot of people when, at the rapture church. They're going to hear this sound. And buddy, they better talk fast. Lord, forgive me, forgive me. I repent, I repent, I repent. Oh, that's gambling with your future. You don't want to do that. So I prepare myself. I don't worry about nothing. Ladies and gentlemen, God is my witness. I don't worry about nothing. But I, and I don't worry about tomorrow. But I prepare myself for tomorrow. I prepare myself. I get ready. Because we got, ain't no telling what God is liable to ask me to do. And it ain't no telling what I'm liable to ask God to do. To do something for me. Sometimes I just do something off the top of my head. And the, I've had the Lord one time, I couldn't get an answer to prayer. I prayed and prayed and prayed, and I said, Lord, what's the problem? Why won't you answer me? He says, well, if you're not getting an answer, Jesse, what does that tell you? Let the elevator go to the top. I said, now, what does that mean? He said, that means that whatever you decide, I'll back. Now, you ought to write that down, because that's a revelation. If you're not quite getting an answer, you don't know what to do, and you've been praying and praying and praying, and you've done everything you know, maybe the Lord's saying, Whatever you do, I'll back it. I'll honor it. Now, there'll be some things you may do, tell you specifically, do this, do that. But there's some things, like there was the other day, not long ago, I, I gave someone something. And the Lord said, Jesse, I didn't tell you to do that. I said, I know, but I know you would do that if you'd have been standing here. He said, now that's growth. I don't have to come down to you, how you doing, baby? baby. In other words, he expects you to grow up and make some decisions. And sometimes he will let you make some decisions. And sometimes you wonder, maybe I did wrong. He's not answering my prayer. Well, evidently, he totally trusts you enough to handle that situation. And he will back what you do. Now, if, now if you don't have that, then you better stay before God and find out what's going on. Let me say this in close. My Lord, I got hurt. People ask a, a pastor friend of mine, a pastor of our church. We have a church in my ministry called Covenant Church. I don't pastor it because I'm not a pastor. I don't know how to do that. And I tell you something about this field. So I got enough sense to know to do what God calls me to do. And we work together very well. He's such a blessing. But they asked him not long ago. They said, uh, why does it seem like everything but Jesse does prosperous? What is it? And he said this to them. He said, Jesse never goes do something and ask God to bless it. Jesse says, God, what's your blessing? I'm blessing this. That's what I want to do. See, God is the author and finisher of our faith. But he's under no responsibility to finish something he has not authored. Write that down. God doesn't have a responsibility to you to finish something you authored. He has a responsibility to finish what he authors. Now, he also trusts you to make decisions as you grow in the spirit that he may not tell you what to do concerning those things. And you're wondering, why not God? And he, he says, well, whatever you decide will be totally fine. Can I say one more thing? In our first office that we purchased was years ago. I have to give, I, I always joke about my wife, but she's a brilliant lady. When I say, we gonna do this, her name is we. I get the idea and I tell her, go do this. I told her to find me a building. We were starting to grow, when this was, 89? Something like that, 1989. Our ministry was starting to explode on I said, I need a building, find me a building. And so she went all over the place looking for a building. And the Lord gave her a statement. I haven't hidden the building from you. I've hidden the building for you. And uh, so she came back. And she showed me this building. It was a million dollar building. I thought, Lord. She said, Jesse, wouldn't that be something if we could buy this building for $250,000? I said, woman, 
Woman, you can't even buy the, the first floor for two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Then I had to slap myself. Shut up, stupid. God can do something. Well, anyway, we found out we did some negotiating on this building. So Catherine was really, she said, yes, I believe this is the building the Lord would have us there. I said, okay. So she asked me something. She said, I want you to go in this study because you can hear God better than me. This was years ago, not today. She said, because the Lord speaks to me. I don't mean that angry, just does. Jesse, do this, okay? She said, you go pray and ask God. About that two hundred and fifty thousand dollars we were offering for that building, I said, "All right." So I walked in. I said, "Lord," he said, "What?" I said, "Listen, <laughs> we want to offer these people two hundred fifty thousand dollars for your building. What do you think?" He said, "You can offer two fifty, but I'm gonna pay two forty." I said, "Fine." So I come out. I said, "Kathy," she said, "What the Lord say, Jesse? What the Lord say?" <laughs> She wanted to deal in bad. I said, the Lord said that he, we could offer 250, but he's gonna pay 240. She said, get your ugly stuff back in there. You ain't heard from God. Man, God don't talk like that. I said, look, woman, let me tell you something. I know the voice of God. That's what he told me. Now that don't that don't make any sense to me at all. But he said that we could offer 250, but he's gonna pay 240. Now that's it. Now that's all I'm gonna talk about. That's the end of that. She said, okay. So sure enough, we offered 250. Now this building was occupied by doctors. We had a gynecologist, we had a, uh, I don't know, a dentist, uh, a pediatrician, all kinds of, I mean, kind of doctors in there. Doctors sign long-term leases. You wanna, you wanna lease the doctors because they're gonna be there a good while, you understand? Nice built, beautiful building. Well, anyway, we went to the bank. Uh, we went to the people that own it. We offered them 250, they took it. We shouted. Now watch this. I pray. So I forgot about it. we could offer two fifty and God would pay two forty. So we went to the doctors and told them we would not renew their leases. Well, all of them were gone. They were the, there was two of the doctors that were leaving that month anyway because they knew they were going to sell the building. The other person, the other doctor, we had to honor his lease until December, right? Am I correct in that? To the end of the year, and I think we were negotiating in October, September, ladies and gentlemen. So we never thought nothing about. It. He finished out his lease and he left. He was the uh, gynecologist guy. Real nice fellow. Watch this. When, got, when we got to looking at the paperwork, they paid us $10,000. We paid two, we offered two fifty, dollars but God paid $240,000 for that bill. Do you see that? We never thought about that the lease payments would come to us. Because we thought maybe they would just kind of work it out and give it to the you know, people they signed the lease with. But they said, no, why don't you go ahead and give it to, uh, to the, the minister that bought this place. So in actuality, the Lord paid 240 Even though we offered 250 And then when we started growing some more, I bought a piece of property. They wanted $2, uh, $2 million for it. Now I'm in Detroit. I'm at Cobo Hall doing a citywide crusade. I rent big buildings like this and do my own convention. So I'm going to pray to find out what I'm going to preach that night. And the Spirit of God said, Jesse, I want you to go home. When you get home, he said, I want your lawyer to call. You know that piece of property? I said, yeah. I, he, said, he said, I want you to offer him $335,000. Tell him you're going to close on Thursday. You got it? Do it Monday. I heard that. Okay. So I called my lawyer. I said, I want you to call the people that own this property. Tell them we'll go off from $335,000 cash. We'll be at Delta Title on Thursday morning at 11 o'clock with a cashier's check for $335,000. And uh, we'll just pay for the property. He said, Jesse, you can't buy that for $300,000. That's $2 million piece of property. I said, the Lord told me to offer them $335,000 to be at Delta Title at 11 o'clock on Thursday <laughs> with a cashier's check. You just tell them I'll be waiting for them when they get there. <laughs> so my lawyer gets on the phone. He says, uh, sir, I represent Jesse the Planet's Ministries. Yes, we've heard of him. seen him on television. Seems like a really nice man. He wants to purchase your property. Oh, and he will pay cash. Ooh, that's even better. And he told me to tell you, I'm instructed to tell you he'll pay $335,000 and he will be at Delta Title on Thursday at 11 o'clock clock to close. They said, excuse me, that ain't going to happen. Since, since it's going to a church organization, but well, we'll give it to him for 1.7. He said, I'm instructed by Mr. DePlanis to offer you $335,000. He'll be a Delta title at 11 o'clock uh, on Thursday morning to, uh, with a cashier's check for $335,000 and the property be his and you all take your money and you can go home. They said, I don't think you heard what we said. He said, sir, I'm just telling you who I, 
what the man told me and God told him, now what do you want me to do? <laughs> now it sounds crazy, but when you hear the voice of God, they said, well, that's, that's not going to happen. Well, let me just say this. Mr. DePlantis will be at Delta Title at 11 o'clock with a cashier's check for $335,000 to buy your property. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Hung the phone up. That was Monday. Tuesday, they called back. How about $1.2 million? Mr. DePlantis will be at Delta Title <laughs> Thursday, uh, Thursday morning at 11 o'clock with a cashier's check for 300 th- I heard that like I hear you, hear you hearing me. They hung the phone up. I told Kathy, I told my finance director, get me a check for $335,000, make it out to this, these people. They're just looking at me, you got to be kidding. I will be at Delta, I called Delta Title, the lady's name, Abby. I said, Abby, I'm going to do a closing at 11 o'clock. She said, oh, I'm booked for that. I said, no, you're not. I said, I talked to the Lord, he told me to be at Delta Title at 11 o'clock with a cashier's check for $335,000. She said, who, who said that? I said, God said that. She said, well, if God said that, we'll be here, 11 o'clock. That's what you want to do. That's what Abby did. We fixed it. Ladies and gentlemen, God is my witness, me and Kathy, and the board of directors of Jesse the Planet's Mistress walked into that place, and then people came in at 10 minutes to 11, and at 11 o'clock, they accepted $335,000 for that $2 million piece of property. Now, that's not God. I don't know what it is. Now, why Thursday at 11 o'clock? Because at 1 o'clock, Thursday afternoon, the federal government was going to seize all the property from them. They would have got nothing. We are family. Hey, 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 hey. God don't give big oil to foolish people. And we bought that piece of property for $335,000. You're at nine acres of land. Lord, do you know, I mean, uh, and I did, and the doctors were, they said, I can't, how can you do that, Reverend? You got to know the voice of God. But you see, you got to depend upon yourself to keep your oil supply high. Because you can't rely on someone else's oil supply. I'm not saying they won't help you, but when push comes to shove, when they're running out, they go, and they deserve to keep theirs. And if there's ever a delay, you are always prepared. Out of fear, letter of the Lord, there ain't nothing in the world can stop y'all from getting that rocket's place. If you set your mind and put the crosshairs on that baby, oh, God's got to do what he says. God will do what he said. If you know, you can tell Pastor Joel this, if you know that you know that you know, I don't care if the people that want it got billions and billions, it don't make any difference. One day you'll walk down that blessed God and just let, and you can do it cash up front and not have to worry about nothing. And I'm telling you, I know what I'm talking about because if I can do it, you can do it. I'm no better than you are. If I can do it, you can do it. If God will do it for me, he'll do it for you. We are totally debt free. We owe nobody nothing. Jesse Pants Ministries America, Jesse Pants Ministries Europe, Jesse Pants Ministries Australia is totally, completely debt free. Jesse and Kathy Duplantis is totally, completely debt free. Jesse's daughter and son-in-law, Ed and them are debt free. We owe nobody nothing but to love them. Why? Because we, what we decide yesterday gave us a future today. See my point? Do you see that? I'll tell you what, stand to your feet. I'm holding you along here. Let me just say this quickly. I feel this so strong in my spirit. If this church can be debt free, when you go in your new place, it can be debt free. Every one of you people's homes can be debt free, but you're not going to do it by your job. And don't ever criticize your job. Your job has been given to you to sow seed. If you'll live by your giving. My God, listen to me. If you'll live by your giving. My total television ministry is paid for a year in advance. In advance. In advance. I'm bragging on that. Give God the glory. Listen to me. If you if you do with that book, you'll have many opportunities. People will try to change your mind because of religious experiences. Which may be true. But you're not living their experience. You heard the voice of God. Do you understand? You heard the voice of God. I heard the voice of God. And buddy, when I hear the voice of God, ain't nobody going to change my mind. Now, sometimes people think that's arrogance. That's God. No, no. I'm on a mission, man. I will not allow anything to deter me from what God said. Because if I did, I'd be in disobedience.
And sometimes God will ask you for things you never thought he would ask you for. I mean, I, when God asked me for $100, I thought, surely he ain't going to ask me more than that. Lord Jesus, 100 bucks, because I was a Catholic giver, which is a dollar. I don't, and I don't mean that critically, but you know what I'm talking about. You just pass the bag, you put a dollar in the box, you know. And then he asked me for a hundred dollars. I said, Lord, gee, man, well, that's all I got. He said, that's all I asked for. He said, I didn't ask for anything you didn't have. I never thought, Sister Dodie, he would ever ask me for any more. He asked me for a thousand dollars. I like to fell out. I thought, a thousand dollars? He said, that's all I asked for. He said, that's all I asked for. I said, that's all I got. He said, that's all I asked for. Then he asked me for ten thousand dollars one time. Good Lord. I said, Jesus, ten thousand dollars. He said, I said, that's all I got. He said, that's all I asked for. Then he asked me for a hundred thousand dollars. I thought, Lord Jesus. Okay. And you were there when I gave that hundred thousand dollars. This cup. That's all I had. That's it. It's over. That's it. I gave it, Lisa. And God said, Jesse, you've arrived. I said, I have. What did I arrive to? He said, there's no ties. Now, I'm going to bless you a hundredfold. I said, God, I don't know what a hundredfold is on a hundred thousand dollars. He said, it's ten million. I said, how much? Ten million dollars. Did you get it, Brother Jess? Yes, I did. I got ten million dollars. I thought, God, when are you going to ask me for a billion? When? When? You see, you grow to those levels. Nah, I'm not there. Don't mess up. I ain't not giving a billion. But I, I know, he asked me for a million. I've done that. But I tell you what, boy, one day, one day, one day, Oh, I didn't tell you this. When he did ask me for that hundred thousand, that million, he said, Jesse, you notice you have more than that? I said, yes, for the first time. I have more than that. Yeah. And yesterday I prayed and I said, Lord, he, he interrupted me. He said, what are we going to do today? I said, you don't know what you're going to do? <laughs> he said, you're my hands. You're my feet. You're my representative. What are we going to do today? I said, man, Lord. You mean you're going to let me decide what happens today? He said, yeah. Yeah. That's trust. Joel Osteen, trust me. I talked to him a while ago. He said, Jesse, I wouldn't, I'd be there, but I, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't, I'm always there, but I trust you. I said, thank you, Pastor Joe, I appreciate that. I thought, what an honor. You see, I came here for one reason, that you might know my friend Jesus. I know this man. His name is Jesus. He will not lie to you. I made that decision years ago. I didn't know what I was saying. I said, God, if you ever ask me to do anything, I'll do it. I had no idea what that meant. That was Labor Day weekend, 1974. I'll do it. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know the test would come. And the thing, you know those things. But God is honored. He wants to honor you, but he can't honor you unless you let him come into your life. I'm going to ask you to meet my friend. I know I've held you long. I didn't mean to apologize. But you got to meet my friend. This Jesus is my friend. I don't have a relationship. I have a fellowship. We talk. We have fun. We laugh. I'm going to ask you to meet him. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you don't know Jesus today and you'd like to get saved for the very first time, 
would you give me the honor of walking to the throne of God with you? Maybe you know about God, but I ask you, do you know God? You see, I knew about God as a child growing up in church. You know, I went to church, but I didn't know God. I just knew about him. Would you give me the honor of saying, Lord, here's a person they know about you, but they don't know you. And I'd like to introduce you to this man, to this woman, to this young person. They want to meet you, Jesus. And I used to stop there because that's the way I was trained as a minister until the Lord arrested my mind and said, take it further. Maybe you're in this building today. And no, you're not backslid in hell by no means, but you're not living the way you should live and you need to come back to God. Some people call it rededicate. I don't call it that at all. I call it selling out, burning all the bridges behind you. Maybe a Christian hurt you. Maybe a preacher hurt you. Maybe I hurt you. If I did, I apologize. Would you give me the honor of going to the throne and say, Lord, here's a person that's had some tough times. But tough times don't last. Tough people do. If that's you today, it would be such an honor. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you don't know Jesus and you'd like to get saved for the very first time, or and be honest with yourself, you're not where you should be with God, and you need to draw closer to Him, come back to Him, rededicate. Would you lift your hand up? Hold your hand up when I see it and acknowledge it. You may put your hand on. Yes, I see those hands. Yes, I see those hands. Ushers, help me. If you see a hand, I don't see. Yes, I see your hand. Could I see others quickly? By the lifting of a hand, thank you. I see that hand. Yes, ma'am, I see your hand. Up in the balcony there. Thank you. I see those hands. Way up back there, I see your hand. By the lifting, yes, way, way back there by the wall, I see that. Doing that, yes, I see your hand. By the lifting of a hand, you're saying, I want to get saved. Or you say, but Jesse, I got to be honest. I'm not where I should be. Yes, ma'am, I see your hand. Could I see another quickly? Don't worry about the time. It's never too late. Thank you. I see your hand. I know it's 1255. But my Lord Jesus, God want to help you. Thank you. I see those hands. Could I see others quickly? Thank you. I see your hand. Yes, I do. Yes, I see your hand. Yes, I do. Thank you. I see your hand. Yes, ma'am. I do. Thank you, Lord. Look at the people. I'm going to ask all of you to look at me. As I said in the first service, I'll say today, I will never lie to you people. I've had so many people lie to me. Many of you lifted your hand like this. I took integrity to do that. That wasn't easy. I'm going to ask you to do something harder than this. I'm going to ask every one of you, not some of you, because see, you are a person of integrity. You lifted your hand. I'm going to ask every one of you that lifted your hand to get out of your seat and come stand here in front of everybody. Well, what's wrong with that? Jesus hung on the cross in front of everybody. He's not asking you to do that. I want to pray for you, and I'm going to ask you to pray with us. I'm going to ask you to pray a prayer with me. I'm going to ask you to repeat this prayer with me. I'm going to ask you to say it with your heart. Confess it with your mouth. When we finish this prayer, you'll be in God's kingdom. Whether it's a first time salvation or whether it's a selling out for Jesus. Now let me say this. This is not a prayer of feeling. This is a prayer of faith. See, I used to think if I didn't feel God, he was mad at me. Or I'd done something wrong and I thought, man, what's the use? I can't live like this. And the Lord suggested you don't pray by feeling, you pray by faith. But you know what I said? I said, okay, Lord, I understand that. But God, I've always been honest. I, I need to feel. I don't know about you people, but I need a Jesus with skin on it. I don't need a God way over there. I'm not over there. I'm here. I need to say Jesus. And he said, Jesse, I need that. And because I asked that, that's how the Lord speaks to me. He literally called my name. Some people say, I don't believe that. I didn't ask you to. It's just the truth. I mean, I very seldom talk about my heavenly vision. The only time I've talked about was here at Lakewood Church. And you notice that if I run it on television, I use the same one. Why? Because the anointing was so strong on that day. On it. I very seldom ever talk about that. I could make millions and millions of dollars. I've had so many people asking me about this. I had one man want to do a movie on it. I've had people in talk show. I said, no, that wasn't given to me for that. That was given to be just simply a blessing to people. And we honor that. He will not touch us too holy. This prayer you're going to pray is the holiest prayer you'll ever pray. Are you ready? You people watching by television, faith destroys all distance between God and man. I'm looking at a television camera. You're looking at a television set. But God is looking at both of us together. If you'll pray this prayer with us, as these people here are doing today, the Spirit of God will touch your life. I did what you were about ready to do years ago in 1974. Billy Graham led me to the Lord Jesus Christ. Just as I'm about ready to lead you to the Lord Jesus Christ with a prayer. A very easy prayer. A simple prayer. Are you ready? Are you ready? It's going to be wonderful. It's a great time. Jesus, I love you. If you just let it. 
I'm going to ask everybody in this audience to pray this prayer with us. Let's pray it together. Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. I confess my sin before you this day. I denounce Satan and all his works. I confess Jesus as the Lord of my life. Thank you for saving me, for bringing me back to where I once was. I believe with my heart. I confess in my mouth that Jesus rose from the dead. I am saved. Write my name in the Lamb's book of life. And today is my God day with the Lord Jesus. I pray this prayer to the Father in the name of Jesus. Amen. Stand right there for just a minute. Give him a hand clap. You made it. You made it.